Hi, welcome to this Dune themed video. I have been stoked to watch the film. I've been waiting for a year and a half. I was not disappointed too much by the postponing because a lot rode on this film being a success because it's a third attempt at a Dune adaptation. The first one was, I think, the Jodorowsky's attempt. It was an unfinished project. There was the Sci-Fi Channel series about events from the later books, which was a success but has bad CGI. There was also the David Lynch Dune, which was a pretty cool movie but a bad Dune because it condensed the whole story into a single film and it just doesn't work. This Dune, the 2021 Denis Villeneuve version, spans only around 40% of the book, I'd say, and in this video I will be elaborating on several concepts which are sort of described more in the book, but I won't be spoiling anything, but I will be spoiling the whole movie because I will be discussing different visual aspects of the show. With the Dune, I really had this slumdog millionaire moment where I can see different references just going back to different points in my life. I think it was a very bizarre experience. Having said all of that, I will be drinking good stuff, which is a yerba mate soda, and yeah, uh, welcome! Intro? Intro? I've split this video into seven parts, but before I go in, I want to mention the decorations behind me because it is somewhat relevant. Wojciech Schulmach, the author of these pictures, which I've cut out from my wall calendar, did the most famous Dune cover, series of Dune covers, but they only come in hardcover, which I don't enjoy, so my Dune cover looks like this. And I also chose specifically water and sand themed pictures because they are relevant to the plot somewhat. Part one, world building and distribution of power. I want to elaborate on it a little bit, but all of the key components that I mentioned were at least mentioned in the movie. So first of all, the world looks like it does with some weirdly anachronistic elements, but also a lot of modern elements such as space travel because 10,000 or so years ago, humans fought computers, like alternative intelligence, which started thinking for itself and they won. But because of that, that event, computers as so were prohibited. And if we don't have computers, we need the human mind to be able to calculate and come up with the calculations that usually we put on the computers. And that's where SPICE comes in, because SPICE from planet Arrakis expands the mind. A little disclaimer for the video, I am Polish, so if I say a word weird, I am either saying it the Polish way or the Polish accent, and you just have to deal with that. The division of power. In Dune, the movie, you really spend most of the time with only one subsection of it, but I'd say that the power is divided it's split four ways. Nominally, the most important one is, of course, the Emperor. However, his power is limited. Under him, directly under him, are several houses, such as Harkonnen and Atreides, so the most important houses in the movie. They're just like royalty translated into the Dune setting. The Emperor just comes from a house like all the other regular houses, but they are the imperial dynasty. Harkonnen, Atreides and others are subservient to the emperor and they have power over their own um, worlds but also have to do the emperor's bidding such as the Atreides do at the beginning of the movie when they are being sent to Arrakis with, because of the political maneuver to um, take away their power. You've seen the film. But there are also two fractions which did not really get out of screen time. The third is the religious female coven of the Bene Gesserit sisters. Their name comes from a Latin expression, quam Dius Bene Gesserit, which is as long as it's behaving well, but also uh, I think Frank Herbert, the author of the book, or, or his son mentioned that, well, Bene means well, but the Bene Gesserit kind of so sounds like the Jesuit coven, Christian coven, its teachings are 
mm, somewhat Bible themed, but there are also aspects of, uh, I think, Judaism and Islam as well. There, it's like a one main um, monotheistic religion. The Bene Gesserit are dedicated to expanding the body and the mind in a way that appears as magic towards those who don't really get what is happening. They are dedicated to kind of leading the empire in a eugenistic way because they are only women. They send their sisters who are priestesses, but also they are not celibate. They, they're, they are sending the sisters to different courts where they become concubines, seduce the rulers and have very specific children. They, are, they really, really make sure that the right children get born which is something that Jessica went against when she decided to give birth to Paul, a son. Her commandment was to give birth to only daughters. And the fourth power is the Spacing Guild, who have the monopoly over space travel, which is divided into regular and faster than light space travel. Not going to elaborate a lot about them, but I just wanted to point out that it's a huge power if they own all the means of transportation. They are, I think, politically neutral, but of course you can make deals with them and stuff. They don't take a huge role, but they are very significant. So I thought that I pointed out. And that's it for world building as such. But I will now move on to point number two, which is architecture. So the literal world building. In interviews, uh, set designers and Denis Villeneuve mentioned mostly having been inspired by the World War II bunkers, but not only that, they also were inspired by brutalist architecture. Denis Villeneuve also took that kind of inspiration when he worked on Blade Runner uh, 2049. Brutalism is a, an architectural movement where it originated in late 40s. I think the first brutalist building is Le Corbusier's Marcillian block, that's irrelevant. What's relevant is that brutalism is focused on functionality, form, but also appreciation of materials. It is called brutalism because of the material it's it used most, which was beton brut, so just concrete. But what it sounds like, brutal, makes sense and is applicable because it's very much raw form over function. And because of the, the usage of concrete, it also kind of is evocative of the general shapes of the World War II bankers. There is a relationship. I won't say how much when it comes to the inspiration, direct inspiration for architects who designed in that movement, but clearly, visually, there is a reference. Also, moreover, the bunkers with their small windows and also with, with concrete's coolness, indoors preserving properties make sense as the building material for the desert. They also mentioned having been inspired by Brazilian brutalism. They, it directly mentioned in the interviews that I've read, but it doesn't make sense to me because Brazilian brutalism, except for this one building, Brazilian brutalism is more colorful. It, like Le Corbusier, it introduces color and the forms are dainty and thin and not really suitable for the harsh conditions of the desert. And to quote, I think Denis Villeneuve or the set designer, the vibe was supposed to be a futuristic take on the past. And I really, really got that. I want to also mention that brutalism are, as architecture is something that truly inspires more modern architects currently. And I think it is due to what we understand as opulence and futurism now. Because of the rising prices of apartments and houses, we associate space with luxury. So in order to evoke this feeling of opulence, it is best done with using huge spaces. Also, it is, again, a modern trend to show raw materials such as wood or concrete within architecture, so it would make sense that the palaces of the future, such as seen in the movie, are very much that, are very much a lot of form and a lot of space, 
with uh, decorations being very limited just to slight architectural sculptural forms and with that i'll move on to number three which is the ancient inspirations and that's my first slum dog the millionaire moment when the camera spans the city of arakin and flows over it my mind went that's ziggurat of ur a sumerian building which was relevant to me because i wrote polish matura like polish sats in art history i have a matura exam in art history and ziggurat of ur is one of those really really relevant buildings and i found a confirmation of that in the interviews it was one of the direct influences i think in general the concept of step pyramids also and mayan aztec and such and such cities also could have played a role in that in the design of different buildings within arakin and the but and the second just throwback to ancient cultures is very very brief in one of the first scenes when when paul fights green there are reliefs those flat sculptures in the background and they are probably something to do with his house's history but they are clearly inspired by ancient egyptian reliefs the it's a clear inspiration just a parallel that i thought that i'd point out and with the mention of paul's literal house i'll move on to the house atreides so the family that Paul comes from. The origins of it are also ancient, but I thought that it deserved its own point. So the origins of House of Treaties actually come from ancient Greece, ancient even for us, with its progenitor being Atreus, the king of Mykene, of M Mykene. From what I remember from history, Atreus's ancestors also did some shady shit but that's irrelevant because he was the progenitor of the family and he also did some pretty vile stuff for which he got cursed supposedly so if you know that the history of the family is cursed that foreshadows a little bit the events of the movie i think atreus's crime was from what i remember um chopping someone's kids and saving them to their parents to eat in his defense the father was his his own wife's lover you know how the greeks in the mythology are and he had two sons menelaus whose wife was helen of troy later and agamemnon and agamemnon who also participated at the request of his brother in the trojan war was is specifically named as the originator of the Atreides in Dune in some later books. So uh, Agamemnon was killed by his wife and her lover and one of his daughters was Iphigenia so in general the family history did not really get better for 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 some time but clearly they survived to, till year 10,000 so they are not that bad off. I also thought I'd mention that well, I'd, we don't really see a lot of the outsides of buildings on Caladan, but they are also brutalist and big and very raw. But what we do see specific to Caladan are the tombs, which are actually chest tombs. And that type of tomb is most typical for royal burials throughout Europe. But specifically, 13th to 15th century England had quite a lot of those. They are really good looking architectural forms. And with that, we'll go to number five, which is not really related to four, which are the costumes of Bene Gesserit, but specifically, most importantly, Lady Jessica. So let's start with the fact that Dune's costume designer, Jacqueline West, mentioned specifically being inspired by the paintings of Giotto, Caravaggio and Goya and by that I imagine she means first of all the dramatic forms but in the case of Giotto and Caravaggio well all of them to be honest the drama spans from the play between light and darkness and for the costumes she focused on harsh structural architectural forms for the costumes 
but well the all the painters depicted a lot of religious female figures and that's what Bene Gesserit are so I imagine that can be some direct inspirations in the mumus that they're wearing for the most part. West mentions that uh, Giotto who was more religious in his depictions, who focused on religious depictions, was more of their inspiration for the nun like Bene Gesserit and Goya more so for Lady Jessica. Specifically, she mentions the painting of clothed Maya laying down. I don't really see the resemblance, but I believe that was her inspiration. What I really wanted to focus on was, again, something that I really interpreted a little bit differently, is her gown when she visits, well, she when she comes into Arrakis for the first time. Bene Gesserit have planted the seeds for Jessica and her child's arrival years ago, years ago. It's not magic. What I mean is that since centuries prior, there were the Bene Gesserit sisters sent to do whatever work to Arrakis and they started just gossiping about the arrival of Messiah and his mother. And because it's not magic, we must assume that the people of Arrakis, who right away seeing Jessica in her arrival gown, understood her to be the Messiah's mother, they could not have been going based off of a vibe. They had to have specific things to look, to look for in Jessica. I am not mentioning Paul at all because he's dressed in a uniform and I would have assumed that the Bene Gesserit sisters, since they knew that Jessica's son or the Bene Gesserit sister's son would be of royalty, that he would have had to be wearing some sort of regular royal or military uniform. What they had control over was Jessica's outfit and Jacqueline West said that her gown was inspired by medieval gowns. It's not mentioned anywhere, but the first glimpse of her we see on Arakis, the sun hits her veiled face and from underneath her face jewelry glistens. So my theory for them being able to recognize Jessica as the mother of Messiah or part of the two-person two Messiah, Kwisatz Haderach, is that she reminded them visually of spice on sand. Spice on sand is this reddish glimmer on the yellowness of the sand. So that's my that's my theory. That they what they saw was spice, which has some religious significance for them as well. And I think that was that's a little bit anticlimactic. What I am, by the way, what I'm trying to channel is not Jessica herself, but more so her handmaidens in the back. But if the light hits my scarf, there is a little bit of that glimmer, which I hoped would come through and illustrate kind of the vibe that I that I mentioned. I'm sorry if it's a little bit anticlimactic. But for these painters, Giotto, Caravaggio, Goya, I know all of them. But to be honest, I couldn't. I have not. None of the depictions of Jessica were truly evocative of these paintings to me. Not even the actual Maya Vestida. And the point number five is particularly obscure. It, it is the significance of the Jerboa mouse that we got. I'll first start with the non-spoiler section. I know of that animal because when I was participating in a biology competition in middle school, there was a question about the big ears of sand animals and why they evolved to be so. In general, big ears, apart from aiding hearing, they allow for the animals to cool their blood easily and quickly. This jerboa was clearly computer animated and it looks the most, for I did extensive research, to me it looks the most like the Mongolian jerboa, which could not have been filmed for the fact that there there's very little of them and we don't really have conditions in which a Mongolian jerboa would have been filmed, but I think they probably just mixed different types of jerboas to achieve that what they were looking for. But what I wanted to mention is that there is a scene where the jerboa has uh, gathers moisture on its ears 
and then presumably drinks it. That's not what the ears are for and gerboas specifically don't drink. They get all their moisture from seeds that they eat. The mechanism of having a big surface to gather water from is used by sand beetles, which I saw in a documentary once. A guy dressed as a beetle to see whether he would be able to gather enough water if he also stood on a dune at dawn for the uh, dew to gather. And it's not enough for, for a human scale, but the beetles gather around moisture that way. Just they, they stand with their butts up at dawn and they gather the dew. So now a spoiler warning, because I will be talking about the significance of this creature a little bit. This creature within the Fremen language is called the Muadib. So that's the sand mouse. And that's actually a pseudonym that Paul will choose later on to go by. That the significance of the mouse is that the Fremen believe them to be very smart, but they, it's also, you know, very innocuous looking. So that's that's why Paul will choose to go by that name. Um, the mouse in the movie foreshadows him taking on that road. And spoiler, part six is folds. I specifically have two issues with the movie. One is small. There is a scene on Caladan where a huge ship emerges from underwater and it is the worst CGI in the film. It is pretty excellent, but water is one of the substances that people, humans, we are most familiar with. So it's easy, very easy for us to tell when there's something wrong with its animation. That's why we're, we've been, you know, complaining about the water animation in games for since forever. It's gotten better, it's still not perfect. And here, when the ship emerges, it's not, it's clearly not real water, it's physics water. You can see that it's been computer calculated to look as real as possible, but it is a bit too sticky. And also some of the dripping drops look like the waterfalls from Lord of the Rings, which the animators achieved by animating salt, like salty texture. So it doesn't really look very realistic and it's very noticeable, especially if you go to see it in IMAX, which I did once. I thought for a second that maybe they could have just built a model, but as I said, humans are very familiar with water and its texture and on a smaller scale, water is very, very sticky. Imagine like the droplets sticking together. So it would have looked like too thick, too thick as a substance if they just built a model and made it leave the water. So that was the best way to do it, uh, CGI. But it's noticeably not that great. And my second fault is not really strong, but the Fremen suit are gender neutral in form. Technically, I mean, they are very form fitted and they are very beautifully designed. It's very believable that they work that they, the way they're supposed to. They even built tubing in the costumes so that they would be as realistic as possible. So to just make sure that certain types of engineering inside them is possible. But my issue with it is specifically with Paul's still suit. So in designing of armor, specifically mostly computer game designers want to want to make the armor female, they add boobs on the armor. And all the still suits look the same and they have this dark patches here um, around lungs. And that's what they are supposed to be most likely. But because uh, Timothée Chalamet does not really have a very broad shouldered figure, which is a trait, it's not negative, his suit has these patches kind of around the pectoral region and to me they do look like boobs in video game armor. It's not a very big complaint and I don't want them to fix it because it's specifically because of his build that they appear in that place. But I do think it's a, they could have done it a little differently, just make them a little higher and a little bit more rectangular and this, this boob illusion would not have been there. So a very small uh, issue. And for number seven, I just wanted to mention, this will be super quick, this weird Harkonnen pet, which eats a food when, in one scene. It's not there in the book. It's a fully for movie invented. And I think that this pet 
apart from just being world building and cool looking, could be tied to what Dr. Yui says. He says that Harkonnens take people apart like dolls, so we, if we connect the dots, can assume that that creature, apart from having human hands, is just a pet build of human parts. If we want to go in a very morbid direction with our head cannons, possibly Dr. Yue's wife. Hopefully not. And with that, I'll wrap things up. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, consider subscribing and maybe liking this video, leaving a comment if you're feeling generous. And if you're feeling extra generous, maybe consider supporting us. There is a link in the description box as well. All the funds from there go to Kira's training as a dog therapy dog or just her general obedience training. Thank you. See you next week and bye-bye.